Shalom. This week we are reading Parashat Shalach. Shalach Lecha, send for yourself. You know, like many other people, I find myself profoundly affected by the events of this week's Torah portion. In fact, I could say that this Parsha has me tied up in knots. The truth is, we are taught that we are all truly profoundly affected by the sin of the spies, which was the sin of speaking evil, malicious, baseless slander against the land of Israel. I say we are all affected because this sin was so severe, so grievous, our sages teach, that it sent like concentric shockwaves out into existence, and those shockwaves, like the sin itself, remain at large. It's one of those sins that must be rectified in every generation. One of the sins that presents challenges, presents us with challenges and opportunities for fixing in every generation. That beckons us and begs us practically to get our act together and get it right. And that sin, what is it, the sin of the spies? What made it so severe? As recorded by Torah itself, it was the most severe sin committed in Jewish history. More severe than the sin of the golden calf, because after the sin of the golden calf, the people of Israel were still slated to enter into the land. There had been no major change in plans. But this week's portion of Shalach, send, send the spies, tells us that when the spies came back from their mission, and 10 out of 12, that is everyone, with the exception of Yehoshua and Kalev, all of them spoke ill of the land, demoralized the people, told the people that they're not strong enough to defeat the nations who were there, caused the people to share their bizarre crisis of faith, and caused the people to weep all that night. And this happened to be, oh man, uh, the ninth of Av ring a bell. This was the first Tisha B'Av, and ultimately God decreed that this entire generation will not enter into the land after all, but will spend the next 40 years wandering around this desert. And only the next generation and their children, and actually, truth be told, their wives and their mothers and daughters, because the women were not involved in sp neither speaking nor listening to, accepting the sin of this tale-bearing against the land of Israel, they're the ones that would go in. And by the way, on that same day, in the future, both temples would be destroyed, did I mention? The Jews would be expelled from Spain, oh, World War I would begin, Gush Katif would be destroyed, all sorts of stuff would be set into motion, all as a direct result of the sin of speaking Lashon Hara, evil speech against what the Book of Psalms calls, in David's words, the precious land, the land of Israel, a sin defied defined by God himself as being more severe than idolatry. An absolute game changer that God said will simply not be tolerated because the honor of God in this world is the land of Israel. So till now, everything that we've said is sin of the spies 101, it's all quite obvious, everything that we've been reviewing. I always find myself fixated year after year when we study this Torah portion on how such a thing could happen. I mean, how could, after all, these men were tzaddikim, they were righteous men, they were rashay b'nei Yisrael or the verse indicates to us they were the heads of the tribes of Israel. And every year we learn about this and we try to extract a lesson for ourselves. The overwhelming consensus of opinion seems to agree that their freak out, you know, again, I call it that because they left, they were considered righteous men when they began their mission, but they came back with a definite warped attitude about the land of Israel and a, defin a definite, may I say, yes, I must evil agenda in dissuading the people and in, and in shaking their confidence. So the vast majority of opinion seems to agree that this freak out was caused once again, as we have had opportunity to point out in other uh, up in other partiot here in the Book of Numbers, it was caused by their own lack of self-confidence. By not believing that God has what it takes to go the distance against their enemies, really they didn't believe that they deserved 
that God should do that for them in their lives. So that means that they didn't believe in themselves, right? Plus there's the factor of ego, the idea that they knew, some point out, that once they reconfigure as a nation, startup nation, in their land, they're not all necessarily going to have the same jobs that they have now. They may not be chiefs anymore. And there's another idea expressed that this whole debacle was actually born out of a misunderstanding on a far more spiritual level. That they suffered a disconnect from what reality really is. This has to do with the fact that all those years that they were traveling in the desert, they enjoyed a very rare closeness with God, a very rarefied intimacy. They ate the manna. They were, they were miraculously protected from all sorts of mishaps in the desert. God was so connected with them and they were kind of afraid, according to this opinion, of losing that level because when they would go into the land, the manna would stop. They would have to plant, till the soil, harvest, be regular people, and bring God, as it were, with them into the land, but live the way people live, which, of course, is what the Torah is all about. In any event, it happened, and today, actually, I want to try and look at this whole thing a little differently. I'm going to temporarily suspend my own need for answers as to how this happened and just say, you know what, because, because that's how we roll, because that's people, that's the human condition, it don't it always seem to go, whatever, it did happen. I want to go a little further and in a different direction. If you remember, I mentioned that I was tied up in knots. So here, at the beginning of the Torah portion, we read, that <clears throat> Hashem said to Moshe, saying, Shlach lecha anashim, send for yourself, by the way, send for yourself means, God says, it's not my idea, but I won't stop you. If you want to do it, do it. Send forth men, if you please, it's translated here, and let them spy out the land of Canaan. And in Hebrew it is, viaturu, viaturu et Eretz Canaan, and the root of this word, Tor, tough, vav resh, tough resh, actually means like tour, right? Go and travel and look and see. The Yaturu at Eretz Khan, go and have them spy out the land. But you know what? This same word means something else entirely. Lahatir. It means to loosen. It's the same language, exactly the same word, to untie. So, you know, Eretz Canaan, the land of Canaan, which God in His ultimate wisdom first had occupied by the seven pagan nations, the land was still tied up with those nations, and these men were commanded to untie it. Shlach lecha anashim, send for yourself men via Turu at Eretz Canaan, let them untie the land through their traveling, by their walking, in steps being connected to faith in God, the spies had a mission to untie that knot. And this is the intention of our sages when they teach that the land of Israel is dependent upon the children of Israel. Because the land itself is a great mystery. It is a knot. The only ones who can reveal this mystery, who can untie the knot, are its people. And you need look no further than history. Those who would care to study the history of this land to know that it did not reveal itself, flourish, or allow itself to be untied under any people other than the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel seek out its welfare, it seeks them out. As we find in the verse, Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 17, Sion, ein dorishla, Zion, no one cares about her, which our sages teach, indicates to us that it requires someone to care about her. The land is like, if I may, buried treasure. It's not for nothing that the Holy One, blessed be He, sent these men, the heads of the tribes of Israel, who were supposed to understand and to reveal this hidden treasure that our holy forefathers so longed for, way back even when God told Abraham, go to the land that I will show you, teasing him, not even mentioning what it is. I will show it to you in Abraham just had this tremendous pining for that land because of this secret that lies at its heart. 
God wanted to make his heart grow even fonder. And truly, God gave us special commandments that are specifically connected to the land that have the power that through these commandments we can bring forth the light of the land of Israel. We can actualize the potential of that hidden treasure. We can untie the knot. And thus, we will find later that God consoled them after telling them they're not even going in, consoled them, we're going to be talking about this in a, in a bit, consoled them with the libations and the challah, that their hearts should not fall. Folks, that if those great ones will reveal not us. Find it. In other words, he gave us the present, and he gave us the way to receive the present. It's not, this is a deep teaching, it's not good enough to give something to someone if you don't give them the instructions, if you don't tell them how to derive benefit from their present. And this is the answer to all the criticisms about the land of Israel. How are you looking at the land? Through what eyes? Through what standard of measure, with what expectation are you looking at this land? Because it will do you no good to compare the land of Israel to any other land. Because it doesn't work here the way it works anywhere else. The land is locked and there is only one people who holds the key. And that key is the fulfillment in this land of the Word of God. And then, when that happens, instead of concentric circles of tragedy rippling out, we have concentric circles of light and blessing rippling out into the world. <clears throat> the funny thing about knots, sometimes they need to be untied, and sometimes they need to stay tied. So in the beginning of the parsha, God essentially says to Moshe, okay, send them for yourselves, be a turu at Eretz Canaan, and have them spy out the land of Canaan, which as I'm explaining to you also can mean have them untie the land. And then we find a usage of the very same word towards the end of our parsha when we are learning about, when we have been commanded in the commandment of not, tzitzit. The fringes that are to be made on the corner of a Jewish male's garment, the tzitzit, which feature a string of sky blue. The tzitzit, the fringes that are comprised of strings and knots that symbolize and remind us of all of God's commandments, like the proverbial string around a finger. One of the functions of tzitzit on the garment is so that we never break our attention from our covenant with God. And in verse 39 of chapter 15, we read, It shall be tzitzit fringes for you, that you may see it and remember all of God's commandments and perform them. And then the verse continues and says, Velo taturu. Same word, but this time it says, And don't. When in the beginning of Shalach it said, Viaturu at Eretz Canaan, and they will, whatever that means, seek out or tour or untie the land of Canaan. Here it says, Velo tatur, and do not, it's translated as stray, or look after your hearts and your eyes, which you stray after. In other words, God is imploring us, don't untie your hearts, and don't untie your eyes from me ever. Stay focused, keep the string tied. So how do we untie the secret of the land of Israel, and how do we keep ourselves tied? In other words, how do we, in our own time, act to rectify the sin of the spies? By countering anti-Semitism? By countering anti-Zionism? By boycotting the boycotters and exposing the evil of the boycotts, divestment, and sanctions movement? I don't think the problem is the world slandering Israel. I think that's sort of neither here nor there. There are always haters out there, you know? It's a problem, but it's not the problem. The problem in our parsha is the Jewish attitude towards the land, because it's the Jewish people who hold the key to the lock, and for whom the land is waiting for them to show concern, to show drisha, caring about the land, and for whom the land will reveal itself. And so it is today. What is the Jewish attitude towards the land? Because all the surveys of the diaspora communities, what percentage of alienation is there from the state of Israel? It's a very popular topic. How connected are Jews today? By the way, speaking of the diaspora, you know that in 
this week's Torah portion, the punishment was not to be able to go into the land. So, like, what do you think? How connected do the world's Jews feel today? Are they embarrassed of the state of Israel? Do they find it to be a political liability? Are they themselves, God forbid, buying into all of the lines of today's Amalekites? So again, I ask those who criticize, how are you looking at the land? Through what eyes? Through what standard of measure? With what expectation are you looking at the land? Because it will do you no good to compare the land of Israel to any other land. It doesn't work here the way it works anywhere else. The land is a lock. <clears throat> there is only one people who holds the key. And that key is the fulfillment in this land of the Word of God. And then, when that happens, again, light and blessing going out into the world. Have you ever noticed that week after week, behind me here, you see this flag, and you see the Holy Temple? And have you figured it out yet that we're trying to tell you something? That it's not over yet, that this is not as good as it gets, even though it's very good, that the best is yet to come. That we haven't yet fulfilled God's expectations, but that we do have the key to unlock the lock and to bring the light out. And another thing, something very beautiful about this parsha, almost unspeakably beautiful. Here we learn, here we witness the source of God's mercy and unending love for the people of Israel. Because that never ends no matter what. And right after the decree, against going into the land was made, and its severity was understood and driven home by, by the ill fate of those who tried to rise up and go on as if nothing had happened. Chapter 15 begins and we read, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you will come to the land of your dwelling places, and God foretells, He indicates to them that they will be going into the land, not them, but their children. And he gives them another key, these two special commandments that are uniquely and intrinsically bound up with the land of Israel. The libations in the Holy Temple and the commandment to separate challah, a portion from the dough. This was such a divine kiss, a beautiful sign of divine forgiveness and goodwill that after everything, the nation will be going into the land and building the Holy Temple and bringing their libations together with their offerings of free will and peace offerings and festivals and the mitzvah, the commandment of challah, heralding prosperity, sustenance, and an unbreakable bond with the land itself. I mean, the message of those libations and the challah, this parsha, is so upbeat, so holy, so full of the promise of redemption, so full of the roots of God's love forever, the accepting of the people of Israel, the clear message is that God chose this place and that doesn't change and it never will and it never has. But this is a future vision because He's speaking to that generation, telling them when you will go in and bring your libations and you'll take your challah from the dough, but it's not about them, it's about their children. So it's like, I can look at myself and I can say, about my life, well, you know what, maybe it's not about me at all. Maybe nothing that I ever did even matter because it's about my children and my grandchildren. And certainly, that's how they had to look at this. It's not about them at all, it's about their children and what they will do and go through. You know who knew this? And this is really very, very uh, amazing. Someone else in this Parsha who knew this, who knew that it wasn't about him at all, but it was about the next generation, all of a sudden, when all these profound themes are going on, we have this description right before the tzitzit, before the end of the Torah portion, where we have the, the portion of the fringes, we have this public Sabbath desecration in the wilderness. That's a very kind of strange section. And there's a man, and uh, we don't know who he is. Actually, I, I think we do, but that's another, another story altogether. And he was a good man. And they found a man gathering wood on the Sabbath day. And you know, 
uh, there's a death penalty for a person who was told to stop and knows better, but is publicly desecrating the Sabbath, but it had never been done before and they didn't know exactly how to do it and what it, what it meant. And so we have this man, and you know, there's a really interesting tradition about who he was and what he was doing. He actually was a very righteous person. And he was afraid that the children of Israel did not really get it, did not really understand what Shabbat really meant to the survival of the nation and the universe and the world. And he said, you know what, someone has to teach them that there is no rehearsal here, that this is real, that we have a responsibility. And according to this tradition, he did this deliberately. He set himself up to take a dive so that they would understand what happens when a person does this. So his thing was, you know what, because people look at this and they say, well, this is like what, what are we like, this is like Sharia law? It's like what kind of a thing to do is that? But that's not it at all. It's that the Sabbath is the source of all blessing for the entire world. And it's a nice day. It's a day off. It's a wonderful day with the family. But it's also a pillar of creation. And we took that upon ourselves at Mount Sinai. And we are imbuing God's creation with that aspect of sanctification when we keep the Shabbat. And this is a mandate that we have. And he felt very responsible for the people to demonstrate just how serious that is and that we are responsible for the world and we cannot destroy it. And he must have been saying to himself, just like the children of Israel when they received the commandment of the libations and the challah that they knew would not apply to them because they're not going in, he must have been saying, it's not about me at all. It's about what I am doing for my people. It's about the rest of the people. It's about the continuum. Just as when we read this Torah portion, we understand that we have the opportunity to affect tikkun, to stop the ripple of the concentric circles of tragedy, to try and get our act together and do it right and fix the sin of the spies not just by stopping to slander the land of Israel, but by understanding the lock and the key and who holds the key. And that when the children of Israel dwell in this land and perform here the word of God, the blessing and the light that comes out to every nation of the world is the very purpose of creation. And this parsha really isn't so sad after all because it features this incredible promise and cr incredible vision that no matter what, God has not changed his mind, that the children of Israel will come into this land and from here will go forth the opportunity for spiritual elevation and for perfection and for rectification for the children of Israel and for all humanity.